get this started man. Over the centuries, many animals have gone extinct in North America. Today we talk about the life and death of America lost parrot, the Carolina Panky, and where the, how it died, and how it can be brought back. Maybe. Parakeet was a bird native to eastern and midwestern North America. The Carolina Parakeet was perhaps the most unexpected surprise for the colonists of any of the birds living there. The common perception of parrots is that of a tropical bird, but these parakeets had adapted to winter snows and frigid nights. These are the only parakeets found in North America and the northernmost of all the parrots. The thick goat parrot was found in the southwestern U.S. That's for another time. A glossy, bright forest green bird with a yellow head and orange face. It was described as a beautiful bird, one of the most brilliantly colored of America's birds. Hatching spent the first month of their lives were covered in a mouse gray down to 39 to 40 days when green tails and wings appeared. Juveniles were generally all green with no yellow edges to wings and thighs and lighter underparts. transformation to adult colors and they reached full adult plumage around one or two years of age from some parts of green. Adult males and females were largely identical in plumage but males were slightly larger than the females. And according to Audubon, the male's feathers are brighter and more brilliant than those of the female. Two subspecies existed. The western parakeets ranged for the Missouri, Mississippi, River Drainage, south of Texas, eastern Mississippi, north to western New York State, and the Great Lakes region. Eastern parakeets were in southern Florida and to Virginia. The subspecies had differences, and the differences in the western parakeets were appreciated here as follows. In addition, an Audubon Pinky 1811 might show the western Pinky color, but it contradicts some museum specimens, as well as another painting. Wild Rickus calls gave away flocks to the range of between 5 to 200 birds. They had multiple calls, a sharp voice cut the bird, a key, and a deafening shriek that have already been described. These calls particularly illustrate Habitats were hardwood, bottomland, wetland forests, cypress swamps, various floodplains and rivers, and streams, rivers, lakes, and bodies of water, as well as all the cane break areas which overlap with swamps, rivers, streams, and wetlands. In addition, the western sides of the world also have been more midwestern types of habitats in the United States. They were fruit, nut, and seed eaters. wild grapes, but above all, the cockle bird was by far its favorite. They were also really dependent on salt. We have often seen in natural salt deposits like Big Bone Lick back in Kentucky. But because they fed on various kinds of wild seeds, nuts, and fruits, and they were able to endure freezing temperatures, they were able to be one of the few parent species to survive in harsh climates, or survive to as low as 25 below zero. In fact, screaming bears and falling parakeets were observed in snowstorms in Kansas, which goes to show just how adaptable they were. Hollow trees played a very important role in their winter survival. The birds would crowd and huddle together side by side for warmth inside these trees during cold winter spells and snowstorms. It is likely Gulf Coast and Florida populations didn't have the need to do this and huddle up in the winter to the year-round heat. Outside of the winter, these hollow trees were their favorite roosting and sometimes nesting locations, 
In the early morning, the birds would climb to the top branches of their roosting trees to the accompaniment of much chattering and then fly off to feed for several hours. Their feeding behavior made for quite a natural spectacle. When they saw a fruit or seeding tree, or if they were searching for food, the flock would fly over a wide area, spiraling down until they almost touched the ground, and then turn up to rise up to a on the branches. The fin behavior was witnessed by Audubon, who went and made a report about it himself. It will now be shown as follows. When they get to a place with a rich food supply, they do not immediately land like many other bird species, but first get an overview of the surroundings by flying over them in wide circles, first above the treetop heights, then slowly lower and lower, until they almost touch the ground, in flight, then suddenly rise again and land in the tree that bears the fruit they are looking for. They usually land unusually close to each other. I saw branches covered with them as densely as possible. Audubon, who wrote later painting and psychotic portraits of these birds, likened grain eating flocks to brilliant carpets. More specifically, a spiral flight would have been done to check for predators such as hawks. They were known to physically defend their own from predators. If a hawk injured a pair of feet, the flock would mob the predator, dropping the hawk away from the angry shrieking of flocking. They would also try to assist the predator by tooting their own In the afternoon, they sheltered in groves of trees, off their streams where they drink and bathe. Their highest populations were in the southeast of the United States. Particularly in the state of Florida, they were especially called Milo County. An estimated hundreds of thousands may have lived in that state alone. Parachutes they were often seen perched on top of big cypresses. Extracting seeds. They were also numerous in pine trees. trees and large roots, this bird can lay two to five eggs together. The egg colors can range from white to pure white or to just brown and white shades of blue. Another method involved building crude nests on horizontal cypress branches and nesting in large colonies. Though colonies contain at least a thousand birds each, they would nest in small cypress trees if they were positioned on a fork near the end of a slender horizontal branch. Each fork would be occupied and 40 to 50 nests could be counted on the same tree according to Long. This contradicts with Audubon's reports and descriptions from the northern part of the parakeet's range, but it fits the other descriptions of other parrot species' behaviors in the following description. These nests resemble the head of morning birds in caves of cypress trees put together length enough that the eggs they would often lay sometimes visible from the ground in these colonies. The twigs of cypress trees are very well between 5 and 6 feet to 12 to 30 feet. Though this may vary depending on region or upon the individual bird, the accounts may differ from colony to colony. This nesting behavior was likely more common in Florida and the southern United States, though both nesting patterns may have overlapped. Populations in northerly areas of the range are described as nesting at the bottoms of cavities in trees and holes in trees and with females depositing eggs together. These parrot trees, as they can be called by many people, would be the place to sleep as well, and as mentioned before, it was also possibly crucial to run a survival. The western subspecies may have been partially migratory, though they weren't known to leave the continent. The eastern subspecies is less migratory, and long travel in search of food wasn't as common as in the western subspecies. In Florida, the birds lived year-round. In addition, they often suffered parasites and infections. The heads were often particularly infected, and shortly after death, these insects and parasites would shift from the skin all the way to the surface of the feathers, according to Joe and James Audubon. In addition, the adult Carolina parakeet was one of the few birds to be poisonous to eat. The cause of this was due to their favorite food, 
the cocklebur. Cocklebirds are toxic to many animals, including cats, livestock, and humans. For the parakeet, however, it was harmless. Unfortunately for us, the parakeet's flesh would carry the toxin, which can make it potentially poisonous, at least as an adult. For some animals, more than others possibly, the venom was more potent. For cats, it was said they would die within hours after eating the flesh of these birds. As Mark Casey bluntly put it, their flesh are a poison to cats, or their guts are poison to cats. It seems to depend on the translation or the addition. Audubon also talks about how his cats died. Young parakeets and possibly some adults were not poisonous, however, apparently. As such, they were commonly eaten. Parakeet pie was a southern dish in the 19th century. Whether these were juveniles or somehow intoxicated adults wasn't always reported, but John Audubon noted that juvenile or young birds were not poisonous. In fact, Audubon himself claimed that the flesh of the juvenile Carolina parakeet was tolerable food, and he talks about eating it. And now, we get down to the relationship of humans and ultimately their extinction. Firstly, before we talk about the Europeans and later Americans, let's start off with talking about how they interacted in their relationships with the Native American tribes. There were many regional names for different tribes for the Carolina parakeet. Here's just a few, for example. In the East Staddley Valley of South Carolina, there was a tribe that went by the same name. I hope I didn't mispronounce that. As the name Estado was a local word for the Carolina parakeet, it apparently seems that the tribe was named after the parakeet as well. The same tribe featured an old legend by the name of Chickasaw Gorges, later Chickasaw Lake. Sorry for the pronunciations. The Estado Valley would come to be one of the last places where the Carolina parakeet as a species were recorded in the entire state of South Carolina. Another locale called Estado Falls appears to exist but according to my source, it's in a different county. Since the early years of colonization, many colonists and later Americans kept the parakeet as a pet in captivity and sometimes in zoos. They often tried to teach the parakeet to mimic human speech to varying different degrees. Some reported success and others such as Audubon did not. John Lawson who succeeded reported that the parakeet could be tamed within two days. In addition, they were sometimes hunted for food like other bird species in North America. As stated before, parakeet pie was a delicacy, especially in the South. There are dozens of recipes for it. This would coincide with an expanding pet trade that would capture so many birds, the wild population would start to decline starting in the 19th century. And then there were the farmers. Farmers start to see these parakeets as a pest or even a menace, as they would sometimes evade orchids and grain stocks, as well as of crops. They would be hunted, shot at, and killed. Since parakeets tended to defend their own, this led to easy pickings. While that behavior may have helped the parakeets from hawks in the wild, it allowed humans to shoot as many as possible before the ammo was gone. Entire flocks can be killed off right then and there. Poachers and hunters would join in, bin shooting, and yes, a whole Carolina parakeet is on that woman's hat. Feather hunting would grow especially prominent in the late 19th to 20th century. Working for millineries and factories that would take feathers and parts from these birds and use them in women's hats and fashion. During the last decades of the 19th century, amateur collectors of specimen birds and their eggs proliferated around the country, and dealers and specimens earned large sums from the sale of these rare birds. The rare of a bird, the higher of a price. Thus, the specimen trade killed many birds, including parakeets. Many birds were killed for collections and specimens by collectors who failed to note the location and did the killing. Multi adults and juvenile birds were often thrown out though Audubon and Chester A. Reed, among other authors, left records of juveniles and multi adults appearances. And some juvenile specimens happen to survive in museums as well. German taxidermist August Carl or Karl, visited the home of a friend in Florida in 1887 and shot some of these parakeets in the backyard of his host as they fed on mulberries. A tree that appeared to be sporting yellow flowers of red centers 
turned out to be a flock of parakeets boosting in the early evening, and he shot two birds for his collection. Another hunter was led by a Seminole man to a parakeet tree, a large hollow cypress tree near Lake Okeechobee in Florida, where he shot as many specimens as my ammunition would allow. Her pet trade, as well as that specimen trade, would capture or kill thousands of parakeets. At least 635 of the eastern subspecies is known to exist in museums as of the year 2005. Due to all these factors, the parakeet population had started to decline since the 1830s. Audubon states so himself in 1832, decades before the extinction itself. But by 1896, vigorous flocks were apparently still recorded. So what caused the final no turning back decline that ended up killing off the species? There is no single factor, and according to some, it's somewhat of a mystery. There are several speculative factors and some known factors, now we go and delve into those. And this next one is going to be a surprising one. Enter the European honeybee. Following its statement in number, these bees may have competed with, and sometimes drove parakeets out of the climbed hollow tree. Poultry disease has been suggested as a possibility, but according to other researchers, no historical records existed of periods being afflicted by any diseases of this kind at the time, however. Around this time, at least some farmers may finally start to tolerate the parakeet, as they were keeping the cocklebur in check, and the cocklebur was a very pervasive weed that sometimes poisoned the livestock. But the species still declined, and ultimately the species was seldom seen outside of Florida and possibly Oklahoma after 1912, the western subspecies, also known as the Louisiana parakeet, was reportedly last observed. Around the time of the early 1900s decade, the pet trade, as well as the feather trade, was still going strong, further causing the decline. Christmas break. Only a few were visible, and the next day everyone was gone. Investigations were unsuccessful. It was only a few decades later that the sad riddle was solved. 
At a village some 50 kilometers away, I found a number of smoking remains of Carolina parakeets, and the landlord reported that Father blessedly shot these strange birds from the Wendy tree within two days. He still remembers his story that the others who fell first were floating around again and again and could have been destroyed to the last. So here too is something about the end of this weird bird. Hopefully that's correct. Hopefully Google Translate isn't being a pain again. Ultimately the bird was apparently hunted out there as well. Dr. Bush's beloved pet Carolina parakeet, the earlier Doodles, who was recognized at the time as one of the last living representatives of the species, died in 1914. Zoos and private collections bred the bird, and some of zoos really tried to save the species. However, captive birds would sometimes simply toss the eggs out according to some accounts. One of these accounts is also an account of the pair in Cincinnati Zoo, the last known captive birds of the species, and reportedly the last known pair of the species known to exist. Sixteen of these parakeets were purchased by the zoo back in the 1880s for just $2.50 per bird. Over the years, the birds laid eggs, but none of them hatched or even incubated, and gradually began dying off until there was only a pair left, cage mates for 32 years. In the late summer of 1917, the female, Lady Jane, died. The mate, Incus, according to zookeepers, entered a state of depression after losing his mate. The following year, on April 21st, 1918, Incus died after three decades in captivity and several months without his mate. According to the keepers, he had simply died of grief. He had died in the same exact cage that Martha, the last passenger pigeon, had died in just four years and six months earlier back in 1914. And this was the last undisputedly confirmed Carolina parakeet to die. It is possible the species survived into the 1920s or 30s. In the locality of Gumslow, Florida, Charles E. Doe, a future curator for the Florida Museum of Natural History, as well as many residents of the area, attest to nests, eggs, as well as adult birds. He also collected a set of eggs on the Kissimmee Prairie in Florida in 1927, said to be of this parakeet. Whether or not these are really from the parakeet has been a source of controversy since at least the 1930s. In the 1980s and 1990s, Dr. Noel Snyder, a longtime Florida naturalist, searched out many of the longtime residents of the southern part of the Kissimmee Prairie who actually knew Charles Doe and who knew the area intimately. He found the corroborating details provided by these witnesses convincing proof that the eggs were in fact genuine. While no adult specimen was acquired, there is plenty of corroborative evidence in support of their validity. Until the late 1920s, sightings were made in Okeechobee County in the state of Florida. Though no specimens were acquired, and thus the sightings were deemed as unconfirmed. In 1937, three parakeets resembling this species were sighted and filmed in the Okefenokee Swamp of Georgia. However, the American Ornithologist Committee analyzed the film and concluded that they had probably filmed failed parakeets. A flock of 13 of these birds were seen near Lake Okeechobee, Florida back in 1920, and two eminent ornithologists at the time, Alexander Sprott as well as Robert Porter Allen, were in search of these last members of the species sometime later in 1936. They reported seeing a flock along the Santee River in South Carolina, apparently in 1938. Other ornithologists at the time, however, doubted the sighting and dismissed the claim. The birds were never seen again after this sighting, and in any case, a portion of the area was later destroyed for construction of a power plant, making the species' continued existence in the area unlikely. About 720 skins and 16 skeletons are housed in museums around the world, and analyzable DNA has been extracted from these specimens. In 1939, the species was declared extinct. In 2009, a claim was made that the species was rediscovered in the northeast of Honduras as an isolated population that migrated into the area before. The claim turned out to be an April Fool's hoax, which was believed by some. In recent years, talks of cloning have been made about the species. There have also been talks of using the CRISPR method to bring them back, or breeding the species as living relatives to look more like it. Another idea has been to let the monk parakeet, a parakeet not that closely related, but inhabiting much of the same range these days, to take over its vacant ecological niche. A genome of the Carolina parakeet has been sequenced, 
forever leaving open the possibility to clone them with CRISPR them back into the world. A test model indicates the parakeet would expand beyond its historic range. And in 2017, the historic range map of the species was changed from its long-standing 1891 version of the old range map to a new, improved, and revamped version of the map, which was marking the divisions between the populations of the two subspecies and the density of populations in the southern United States prior to the decline. In addition, a reanalysis of the 1937 film found that the birds themselves might have been faked. The Carolina parakeet remains one of the most fascinating and tragic extinct animals in recent history. Well, that was a doozy and a long one. Well, if y'all see my last video, y'all went over my next extinct animal video talking about the tar pan and the ancestor of the horses. My next animated video, how it will probably be a sequel to the crash. Part of my Fred Jones series after all. Well, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.